Some of us spend our time playing new releases, or whatever games are in the charts. I, on the other hand, prefer the finer things in life. A great game is like fine wine and gets better with age. But like a fine wine, sometimes these commodities hold significant value. You may not be able to afford thousands of classic games, but I certainly can. <laughs> so I am here to educate you and share with you my experiences with some of the best games of all time. In the mid to late noughties, after many years, Nintendo once again found themselves on top of the console market, dominating sales with the innovative motion control system, the Nintendo Wii. This console's gimmick was so strong, it pulled new demographics into gaming, such as old people. But with this new console, aimed at a much wider audience, many fans of Nintendo's traditional consoles hated these changes and turned their noses up at the product and snubbed it completely without even giving it a chance. I, on the other hand, love the Nintendo Wii. The motion controls may have been gimmicky, but that did not stop Nintendo releasing a large number of quality exclusives on the system amongst all the shovelware. That's my only problem with the Wii. You have to shift through a large amount of manure to find the goodness underneath it. Today, I want to talk about a Wii game which is personally one of my favourites on the system and rarely you even hear anyone mention this game and that game is called Little King's Story. Amidst all the shovelware, minigame cop-outs and other tat on the Nintendo Wii, there are those truly innovative, truly unique Wii exclusive titles. These games are all must-play experiences in which I believe will transcend time when the Wii is old enough to be classified as retro. They will all become must-own games for all collections. From the same brains that fought up Harvest Moon came this hidden gem to the Nintendo Wii. Little King's Story is a real-time strategy, life simulation, role-playing video game developed by Sing for the Wii. The game was published by Rising Star Games in 2009. The player controls a timid boy who has found a mysterious crown which gives him the power to charm people and make them follow orders. Who needs a bloody crown to do that? The easiest way to control people is with fear. So on that note, I urge you to subscribe to my channel or I will track your IP address and come round your house and murder your pet dog. As the king of his village, the boy's goal is to expand the village and make all his subjects happy. The design of the game combines various simulation elements as well as real-time and adventure elements. I can also note that this game was later re-released and reimagined on the PlayStation Vita under the new guy's new Little King story. But I urge you not to play this version as it offers nowhere near the same amount of charm. The easiest way I can describe the gameplay style of Little King's story is basically Pikmin on steroids. This game is similar to Pikmin as it offers very similar gameplay and battle mechanics and carries over many of the same elements, including killing things in large packs and taking home the spoils. This game is just so much more fun and deeper than any of the existing Pikmin games in the series and now I will explain to you why. The king uses his undeniable charm and control so he can issue various orders to citizens. Though starting in what is essentially a cluttered field, players begin to upgrade the kingdom of Acapulco with activities such as treasure hunting and fighting. Within a few hours, players are able to purchase and institute various buildings, training facilities and other castle commodities, whilst the population steadily grows. All important stats, such as population and finances, are tracked constantly through an easily accessible menu system. When walking around, the king is able to select any citizen to follow him. The player can issue commands to each citizen, including actions such as digging and fighting. While the player can have a group of people follow him, he can only issue commands to one citizen at a time. The king's followers start out very limited and weak in capability, 
However, this is quickly corrected as you build more and more different training facilities. With these facilities, the player can send his citizens into the buildings and change them into a different type of worker. This works in much the same way as in Pikmin, where you have red, blue and yellow Pikmin carrying out varying tasks. In Little King's Story, instead the game offers different jobs for civilians, including but not limited to soldiers, carpenters, farmers, hunters and laid-back citizens. Laid-back citizens just appears to be a politically correct term for characters without jobs. You know, dull scum, job seekers, peasants. Each job allows citizens different capabilities and weaknesses. For example, a farmer is exceptional at field work and digging, but is a poor fighter, while soldiers are strong, but lack the ability to traverse environmental obstacles. How do you get the money to build your facilities, you may ask? The same way you would build any empire, by raping and pillaging the land of its natural resources, then spilling a shed load of blood on the battlefields to gain extra materials. How you create any empire? Speaking of extending your empire, the world in this game is huge and varied and it is an absolute pleasure to explore. After you begin to build up your new, clearly warmongering kingdom, some of the other foreign kingdoms begin to feel threatened and begin sending to your kingdom angry, deceased and assist letters. Your personal advisor, Hauser, advises you that you should probably try and take over and police the world in the name of freedom. The king then decides that he has had enough of other cultures and wants to unite the world under one nation's ideologies. Upon initially exploring the game's plot, I soon began to think that I may in fact be playing as the baddies. Because in the grand scheme of things, none of the neighbouring kingdoms deserves the vicious attacks you later inflict on them. Whilst I must admit it's great fun annihilating all the neighbouring kingdoms, I was really expecting a plot twist to arise in the game, where someone would turn up and tell my character he was being an absolute dickhead. But this was never the case. All through the game, you listen to Hauser's insane power mad plans to decimate all the neighbouring kingdoms and with his constant psychotic tirades of his, I made the assumption that he would eventually turn out to be the main villain. But no, no, no. From beginning to end, the king stays just as morally corrupt as his personal advisor. And as you progress through the game, you conquer kingdoms, execute their leaders, then to top it all off, you become a polygamist and rub salt in your dead enemies' wounds by marrying their wives. So all in all, you get to have lots of jolly good fun with your fellow droogs, involving yourself in sessions of ultra-violence and indulging yourself in a little bit of in and out. With all this, and I'm not quite sure any of it was intentional, I found that the game had a perfect balance of childish vigils paired with a dark undercurrent of medieval violence. It's basically like Game of Thrones for children. All the music in this game is absolutely fantastic. But then again, how can you go wrong when the majority of it consists of classical arrangements such as Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? Speaking of which, many of the same songs are also used in the film Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange, which for me personally is why I look at the game in a rather dark light. There is nothing like a bit of ultra-violence and in and out set to the good old sounds of Ludwig van. All you need to do to finalise the game's likeness to a clockwork orange is add this music to the scene in the throne room. On this note, if you haven't seen it already, then I strongly urge you to watch Clockwork Orange. The film is a bloody masterpiece. As you near 
the end of the game, a plot twist does eventually arise. However, it's nothing exciting, such as anything to do with morals or ideologies or anything like that. It's actually a twist which is completely different, but I won't spoil that for you as I strongly urge you to play the game yourself. Another thing to discuss about the game is the controls. Thankfully, for the majority of you watching, this game is motion control free. However, control wise, we shouldn't rejoice quite yet. Unlike Pikmin, Little King's story lacks slightly in the pointer control department. When sending villagers off to attack or perform a task, you use the analog stick to point the king directly at the object and then send the villagers out like a bullet or fireball. If the villager hits, they perform any applicable task. However, sometimes when you miss an enemy or obstacle, it can be a pain calling your villagers back and arranging them in the right order again to resume attacks or tasks in the correct way. This may be annoying at times, but it is certainly not a big enough weakness to stop you playing this deep hidden gem. To summarize, this is one of my favorite Wii games. And quite frankly, I think most of you are absolute morons for not even giving the system a chance. Ooh, I don't like the Wii because I'm scared of motion controls because I think they're pointless gimmicks, which I hate. Little King Story really is Pikmin Plus. Apart from some minor control issues, I feel that the game trumps Pikmin in every single way. And Pikmin is a fantastic series in its own right. In Little King's story, from exploring the large world, to building your empire, to the many intense battles, I feel that Little King's story is a great story to explore indeed. If you enjoyed today's video, I strongly urge you to like, comment and subscribe so you can get regular content fed to you by my channel. Cheerio! He is more noble than me. The rich are more noble than the poor. And those who work hard are more noble than the lazy. Then who is the most noble of them all? Once upon a time, there was a timid young boy who was lonely. One morning, before him appeared, a family of pesky rats. Hey, wait. Uh-oh, where am I? Deep in the dark forest, the young boy discovered a magical gold crown. From the day he put on that mystical crown, they say the boy became a magnificent king. And all men and animals, one and all, they say became his loyal followers. And so somehow, in some such way, the young boy was no longer lonely.